Can you hear me? Yes? Is that loud? Loud enough? Yeah. Louder. Okay. Is that better? Or do I need to stand here? Okay. So, um, just go back. I've been asked to talk about... It's not working. Okay, I'll just stand here. How about that? And I'll turn this one off. Yeah? Is that okay? Much better? All right. Get the technology right. So as you heard, um, I did some work recently on uh, Australian public attitudes to hydrogen, but also um, I'm going to talk more broadly around social licence to operate. And so to do that, um, I just want to acknowledge my co-author on that report, Vicky Lambert, but also a research assistant that does a lot of work for me. And as part of that work, I actually ran some focus groups in Wyala, Adelaide, Melbourne, and down here in Taralgon. So that was some time ago. And I'd also like to acknowledge Arena. I put a picture up there of, I think it was Donny Osmond, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat, who's seen the musical, who loves some of that music. It's interesting, when I first got involved in this hydrogen discussion, there was green hydrogen, there was brown hydrogen, there was black hydrogen, there was purple, and I just actually remember it, this is what came to mind. And so from the public point of view, I think we have to be really careful around the language that we use. And when I was sort of, the things I'm going to talk about, if you've heard me speak at other activities, it's probably not much different. But I'm going to give you some of my thoughts from a theoretical ideas as a social scientist. I want to share some of that, then share some of the public attitude work, but also draw on some other work that I've done on coal and carbon capture and storage. I started out looking at public attitudes to carbon capture and storage way back in about 2004 when CSIRO set up their Energy Transform flagship. And I was interested because previous to that, I worked for a company called The Body Shop, skin and hair care. And I was a real activist. I mean, I've protested outside all sorts of places around, you know, oil and gas and so forth. But actually, I'm very concerned about climate and how we move that forward. And carbon capture and storage, very early on, seemed to be a technology that may have potential. But at the same time, there was some opposition to it. So I was really interested in how do you do, um, broker an honest debate around a technology? Um, because if it does have potential, then we're going to need it. And so I do a lot of work. But when you start talking about one technology, it's about the mix. So you can't talk about it in isolation because there's not going to be one solution to this big problem. And what keeps me up at night, when I look after the Master of Sustainable Energy, we have people from all around the world. And I'm very interested in how we solve that energy poverty issue for the one billion people that don't even have access. And that's my motivation and my bias in, in how I come to talk today. So what is social licence to operate? One thing about social licence to operate is we're very clear when it doesn't exist. And it's often seen through protests and things like that. I was fortunate in my team of Science into Society at CSIRO to have people like um, Kieran Moffat, Aaron Zhang, who actually really started to look at this term and where it started in the mining. And they've actually done some great work at conceptualising a model. But one of the things that we're very familiar with, it talks about the levels of acceptance and approval by local communities and stakeholders. It's not a formal licence. It's informal. But you know when it's there, you know when it's not. It's also about the demands that local people place on the organisation and how they respond to how organisations respond to that. And I guess when, it, in, when it's working, what we see is meaningful relationships between the stakeholders and trust is a critical component. Hard to earn, but very easy to lose. Okay, social licence. Working in CCS, it's a, it's a technology, I've been very fortunate, I chaired the International Energy Agency Social Research Network, which back in 2006 I think had 16 people. By the end we had 70 or 80 researchers from sort of war experience through to PhDs and postdocs. And some work that was done in the regional partnerships in, um, in the US I thought was very interesting. But to me the work that we've done in carbon capture applies to any technology. So although this was done by Judith Bradbury and so forth, it applies. What were the issues? They did this across seven different um, states or regions in the US and the same things came through. A lack of confidence in government, industry and science to manage the associated health, environment and social risks will bring negative perceptions. 
So your trust and confidence in the governance is really important. As well, can we trust them to take care of our problems? And what's happened before? When I did some work a few years ago now over in WA, looking at the place where the Collie Hub was, down in that area there'd been some um, previous issues. They've had to have water pipes. They had the issues with the aluminium and buyback and so forth. And so there were some very negative perceptions. So the, the reputation and the experiences of communities around these companies and so forth will really impact whether you trust that next step. And this other idea of procedural and distributive fairness. What happens with some projects is that the benefits tend to be very global in nature, but often the perception is that we carry the load at a local level. So what's important is who does benefit? And I did some work with the Northern Territory Fracking Inquiry and again, working with the Indigenous people, trying to understand what would work for them. Is the process fair and transparent? Are we being open and honest? The other thing that communities want is, can we have a say in what happens? What was interesting, um, a pipeline process that went through in the US and I was lucky enough to see the people that put that through because there's a huge CO2 <coughs> pipeline. And they went and consulted along the way with different communities. And in one community, they could have taken, they were flexible. They could have taken the pipeline this way past the school or this way past the old people's home. And the old people said, well, we've had a long life. Let's put it this way, just in case, sort of thing. But that flexibility was key to building the trust and getting the project through. The other thing is, will anyone listen to us and who can I call if I've got a concern? So this open communication and transparency is critical. The other thing I want to introduce you, you might have heard the term cognitive misers. And I'm using a picture of the gas fields in Queensland because we do a lot of work in the unconventional space with those communities in Surat was at a barbecue in Sydney with some very good friends of mine. Um, and one of those fellows, very um, well educated, and I, at that time I was working on the fracking inquiry. He went, oh, Peter, we don't, I don't like fracking. And I went, okay, what don't you like about it? He goes, don't know, I just don't like it. <laughs> so I think it sort of highlights this issue of um, cognitive misers. And what happens is people are very busy. Okay, we don't have time, like all of us here have an interest and that's why we're here. But what we're, most time I can remember early on doing is where people just want to feed their kids, get to work, do all those chores and have a nice life. So what we tend to do is that we will seek out information, we'll filter out some, but we'll seek out things that will reinforce our views because it's much easier to go with that. And so what we value is where we, we will um, sort of seek that. And then what happens, so there's this positive reinforcement that goes on. And I would challenge each and every one of us, and I'm guilty of it too, that we bring our views to these, pro and we've got to be open. And that's the idea of when we run these dialogic processes, is letting people have a voice and let's talk about these things. What are the concerns? Can we get those answers? And I guess that's to me what happens around building a social licence with new projects. So let me just share some um, little brief insights so I don't need to go into detail. But as I said, we did 10 focus groups and this was uh, funded by ARENA. Um, and all of the reports are open and available. We tried to do a cross-section first generically. And we heard concerns about water today. And that was what came up as well in this. So, and, and I must admit, I was down here doing some focus groups in April and it was the driest I'd ever seen it. It's lovely to see the green back here now. So water might be an issue for South Australia because we really have so little. We have really so little. South Australia is the driest state in the driest continent on the earth. So these were in Adelaide. The last one was actually down here. You're saying renewables with water. Do we currently have a surplus of water in Australia? You ask people in New South Wales, the farmers, they're all fighting over water. If they went down that path, where is the extra water going to come from? And other questions that came up, and it's probably nothing different from each of us. And that's why I always say it's so important to engage communities because they get their head around this and they do want to learn more. So someone that talked about the need for information and building education, yesterday I was at Monash looking at what, how do we define energy literacy and how do we build that across Australia? And I think politicians are an important part of that. So my, these questions that came, I want to know more about the environmental impacts and what other offsets or derivatives are going to be left. What's the actual production facility going to look like? 
because I know there's a lot of backlash against some renewable ones. People are like, well, I don't want a wind farm next to my house. UQ was accused of being an environmental vandal for installing a 65 megawatt solar farm at Warwick. It doesn't matter what technology, people will be concerned about the impacts on their livelihoods and their lifestyle. There'll be people that love it and people that don't. And then we have to have that discussion. How many years do you keep using coal as a source and what does that do to the environment? I'd have some concerns about safety issues, both environmental and industrial, because it's still a highly volatile gas and I would hate to see a spark setting off something. So I'd have concerns both about environmental and also industrial. So pretty rational responses when you first hear about it. So we did the focus groups and then we actually did a national survey. And what we actually did with this, we asked some generic questions, don't have to worry too much, but then we actually, you know, these three opportunities to be used in transport, for domestic use in the houses and through the gas network and then for export. And we asked different questions for each of those. I'm not going to focus in on too much, but all of that detail is available. But just that it gives you a fairly robust group. So the first question we asked to um, ask people is how familiar were they? And the question we said was, have you heard of it? I have never heard of it. Or how confident would you be able to describe it to a friend? So the purple ones is people that have not heard of it at all. All right. The red they've heard and blue I know a bit about. I was going to walk. But you can see here, so the one... I have to look this way, my eyes are really bad. Um, use of fuel cell in the homes down the bottom was probably the one that least people were least familiar. I actually think we did this back in 2018 before the August report, so it must have been at the start of the year. I think it would be really interesting to ask these questions in a national survey now to see if it's just the community or if it's beyond the community that's now more familiar. The reason why we ask these questions, because often that's where attitudes are formed. People that think they know a lot or feel they have a strong knowledge tend to have much stronger opinions about technologies, positive or negative, right? So it's an opportunity at different times to build that. When we asked people what did they think after they'd seen, we showed them a short little video and so forth, even through the survey. The biggest concern was safety and cost, safety for both people but also for the environment. Not surprising. But interestingly, with the social licence questions, how much would you trust the government and industry, and in this place it was the government, would ensure that there was adequate safety precautions? The Australian public, which I was quite surprised at, were relatively trusting that the government would have that in place. So I think that's also um, interesting to see. What I found when we were doing those workshops is that um, even so, we look at transport and we use the Hydrogen Mobility Australia handout, which on the back shows all these refuelling stations. So first of all, you're talking about a fuel cell electric vehicle and they go, oh, maybe will it explode? And then we talk the fact that they go through the same process as other cars and, you know, so actually it's very similar. And people turned it over and went, well, there's this many refuelling stations, it must be okay. So that sort of brought the risk levels down. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for case studies here. But as with all of the work that I do, the majority of the Australians, the majority of the English, all my colleagues when we do these, would everyone would like their energy to come from renewable energy. But I think there's also this recognition that it has to happen. So in this one, we said, how strongly do you agree or disagree with these questions? So it was on a scale of one to five and the colours, I don't know if you can read it, so one is strongly disagree is purple, disagree is red, Neither agree nor disagree is the aqua colour, agree and strongly agree. So the first one where you had more sort of agree, hydrogen should be produced using renewable energy and electrolysis only. But look at the group in the middle. I've got five minutes. Hydrogen should be produced using fossil fuels with CCS as an intermediate step while transitioning to renewables. A little bit less but still in the middle. Hydrogen should be produced using fossil fuels with CCS indefinitely. So there is tolerance for all of these different productions. And I just thought I'd bring in some of the um, qualitative comments that came up from the focus groups. Regardless of climate change, we should be trying to do renewables anyway. When you think of brown coal, you think dirty. And if they're trying to use brown coal to actually then extract things, then why would you use something that's actually dangerous to the environment and then possibly causing more emissions and more harm? If this is the way forward, then that's great. And if we use coal as a means of getting there, then I don't have a problem with that either. 
Um, it's important to transition, obviously, from fossil fuels, but in terms of managing risk, it would make sense to do both concurrently. So again, people rationalising, coming up with something that would be a good trade-off. What I also wanted to, this is some other work that was done in June to August. It was um, part of our UQ CCS work up in Queensland. But we did a national survey, we used to do national surveys on attitudes to energy at CSIRO. And I think it's really useful every couple of years to touch in and see where people are. And I've just pulled out two. Um, the report's public, I'm happy to send it to you. So we had a national sample and then we went to code about 175 in what we call communities of interest and the communities of interest was the, from the Surratt up to Gladstone in Queensland affected by coal seam gas, unconventional, here in Gippsland affected by hazelwood closure and in South Australia with renewables. So the colours, purple is the national sample, red is the Queensland community of interest, Victoria is the green community of interest and um, orange is South Australia. So when you start to unpick, um, this was how much would you support? This is a technology on a scale of one, strongly disagree, three to seven on the right. So look at the going up for Victoria in the Gippsland support for coal. South Australia, and I can show you these for nuclear, for gas, it's really quite interesting. And my hypothesis was always that people um, tend to be more supportive and tolerant and familiar with the technology. South Australia was always pro-renewables. They came up more supportive in each of those. So this is carbon capture and storage. Again, the top two ones up there, um, there's quite a strong neither agree nor disagree in the national sample, which is the purple, but again also Queensland and Victoria. And this is my point with carbon capture and storage, whenever you engage on this and talk through the challenges, right back from 2004 when I first did the work for CSRO when I was at UQ then, People would talk about if we're exporting coal, we have a responsibility to clean it up. And always after you talk through and they get access to an expert, they become more supportive of carbon capture and storage. And I did some work recently and got exactly the same results. So this idea of having conversations is really important. Now our job, my job is not to change people's views, it's about providing people with access to information, to be able to ask the tough questions. And in Japan, when the Tamakamai project went forward with CCS, one of the things we talk about is being flexible. And so their most impacted in the offshore CCS was fishers. And after their timeline for engagement, actually the fishers still had more questions. And so the CEO said, no, we're not ready. We'll give you some more time. And they continued to engage and actually at the last meeting of the IA, they came with a present to say, well done, Peter, that was a good thing that we actually spent some more time. So I think it's, we can't underestimate the value of engaging and having discussions around these. And it's okay to disagree, but it has to be respectful. Um, so I thought I'd pull out from those early focus groups on hydrogen. Yeah, I've got one minute, so that's going to be perfect. Um, some of these reflections from Taralgan. Around at the end of the focus group, we sort of said, well, if you had to give one reflection back to the government about this or to the hydrogen strategy task force and arena, what would that be? So these are from local people, knew nothing about hydrogen before they came into the room because we use market research. I think this is a great way forward for us to reduce our carbon footprint, but I do think that it needs to make sure that it is affordable for everybody and not just some, because otherwise it won't be sustainable. Aside from the economic benefits of exporting hydrogen, what benefits would that leave for Australia if we're just making it to export, so to speak? Like, this is their language, so it's a bit hard. Like, I agree with what you said before, like with your liquid petroleum gas and that, and they're exporting more than they're giving to your domestic market. So if you're looking at exporting hydrogen, what guarantees could you make that locally, domestically, you have enough to use? So the gas issue was prominent. It's a good idea. It just needs to be done right. There are a lot of things to consider. Take everyone else into consideration when you do this and work with them in order to make it happen. I think we're in a very privileged position where we are, where we have resources available and the economies to be a leader in this field. Maybe not necessarily a leader, but a forerunner. And with most technologies, you never know where it's actually going to end up. So the advantages of not necessarily implementing, but at least exploring it as an option, there could be unseen or unpredicted benefits, as well as the ones foreseen in this. It certainly shows all the hallmarks of something that is worthwhile investigating and investing in, as long as the groundwork is put in to implement it across the board evenly and fairly, 
and safely. It's definitely worth looking at. One of the things that I picked up here running these focus groups as well is that people say, brown coal, there's been lots of innovation projects. We've been lots and lots of trials. We never actually hear what happens to them afterwards. They come and they go away. So one particular individual I can remember, she was like, I really don't want to engage with this. because." And so I think there's also a responsibility that when we're doing these projects and we are engaging and bringing them to the, that we have a responsibility also to update what happened to that project? Why didn't it go ahead or was it successful? So that's just a little bit of extra that I'm throwing into this area. And the other thing people were very strong on was the need for education capacity building. They felt that was something that was a strength of this area um, and with the changes in taste. So I think being here and what's happening here is also really exciting. I think that's it. Thank you.